Night City Stories, Chapter 1, The Nomad The Badlands was a hard, unforgiving desert that tirelessly sandblasted souls to the core till there was nothing left but dry fragments and death. V knew that better than anyone. She'd been living in the desert for as long as she can remember, traveling with her clan, the backers. She'd seen good people turn into monsters and the best ones died too early. That was part of the reason she left the backers. And the other reason, well, she wasn't ready to look that deep yet. And besides, this wasn't a time or place. There was a job to do, and Night City awaited. V wiped the dust off the dirty mirror. While the mechanic looked over her damaged car, she decided to check herself in the mirror. Not that she was too concerned about beauty standards. She wasn't. Especially not when growing up with a scar on her face, or when living in the desert. She wasn't really looking at herself in the mirror. It was more of a chance to think and reflect, away from the mechanic. She was looking past her dark, freckled skin, past the thick eyebrows, past the little round piercings, one under her full lips and others near her olive eyes, and past the short hair that spilled a little over her face. She was thinking, thinking about her old clan. For the first time since being on the road by herself, she noticed a patch on her short sleeve leather jacket. It was the image of a horned devil with wings over the word backers. It was a patch that she normally wore with pride, a sign of belonging, of family. Now it was nothing but the past. She ripped it off her jacket and looked it over fondly for a second. It needed to go. Just like the desert, she needed to leave it behind. A flood of memories were coming back to her until the mechanic's voice pulled her out of her mind. Electric coupling she replied. Said it was nothing then she threw down the patch on Ceremony said you were sure. and grabbed the handheld transceiver that she had set down in the corner of the grease-stained sink. Unlike the patch, the receiver was a connection to the past that was still needed. Guess I was wrong. Can always look for another shop where they won't ask a lone nomad while she's hugging the border, said the mechanic as she walked over to him. He knew that her choices were limited. He crossed his arms and posted in front of her car with a pompous look on his face. He was probably feeling all high and mighty because he was the only mechanic in this small town. Despite his miscalculation of his own self-importance, he was a typical mechanic, wearing dark jeans and a flannel shirt with a high-octane baseball cap on his head. Two sets of parallel metallic lines accentuated his face and almost met one another. One ran down next to his left lines and the other set went up from his jawline. There was a metallic piece on his neck that looked more like a gaping hole. She didn't have time for games, so she brushed them aside. That's fine. Even without the claim, she wasn't helpless. No one can live as a nomad without getting a little grease under the fingernails. What? The mechanic said after being pushed aside. Got sign. any idea what to do? Mm. I'm gonna bypass the coupling and rig a hot wire. V replied while swapping on on. out a couple of wires. There was a spark and a little smoke. Once finished, V made her way to the driver's side, not bothering to answer the mechanic's last question. Okay. Let's see what happens. She said, a little hopeful. Then she set her foot on the gas pedal and pushed the car's on and off button. The engine grumbled and did not start. But the mechanic did start running his mouth, saying, it's like I was She tried again, no luck. After the third attempt, she was relieved to hear the loud, violent outburst of the engine when he finally turned over. Not shabby at all. Said the mechanic as he dropped the hood shut. It'll get me to Night City. I'll figure something else out there. She replied. Bye. 
So doable? Sure was. Satisficing that, not a solid fix. Might as well have used spit and duct tape. It worked. That's what matters. The first thing she did was plug up the transceiver as she tried to use mm. the car's antenna to boost the signal strength. She'd been waiting for the call that would lead her to Night City. The mechanic noticed and said, Antenna on this heap don't seem like it packs a punch. Not liable to hear much. You don't say. As she replied, she noticed a set of dark jeans paired with dark boots coming over to the quarter open garage door. A hand with metallic fingers probably outfitted with a gorilla arm cyberware effortlessly raised the garage door. V quickly stashed away the transceiver when she noticed a golden badge affixed to the no collar button up shirt. It was the sheriff, done in a shirt matching cowboy hat and tie. Hey Mike, didn't know you had a customer, said the sheriff to the mechanic as he walked in. The uneasiness was clear on the mechanic's face. As he stepped out of the way, he stammered. Uh, rolled in a, a few hours past. I, I thought she'd at least called in to you. Don't you swear to Mike. We're gonna hash it out. The sheriff told him. As he came towards V, he vehemently spat on the garage's floor, almost like an animal marking a territory. When he got to the car's driver's window, he said, Don't you know you owe the sheriff a word when you pay his town a visit? To tell him what's brought you here. Maybe even over a cup of coffee. His arrogance was annoying as he alluded to some sort of date or bribe. V wasn't sure. My mistake? I hadn't planned on stopping. A failed coupling forced my hand. She answered apologetically. Last thing she wanted was trouble. Not in Yucca. A small town just outside the border of Night City where some small time pretentious sheriff could make her disappear. And no one would know. Or worse, no one would care. Not even Mike, the mechanic who was watching the exchange across fingers of smoke coming from the cancer stick he had brought to his lips. Yeah, always some failure high mistakes. Name's Andrew Jones. Probably heard of me. Served in spec ops during the last war. Silver showguns? Ring any bells? She let the sheriff talk about himself. When she didn't indulge, he said, don't like to get along. Then he sauntered to the front of the car and set a foot on V's bumper. That a nomad vehicle? Might have expected that. He asked about her clan, just like she expected. She tried to dismiss the question by saying, I'll just fix it up and go. I have no reason to linger. <sighs> no, you sure shit don't. He replied, Nothing boils my blood like a fucking strain. Where'd your clan pitch camp? Then went on to ask another question about the clan. There's no clan. There's no camp. I'm here alone. And she decided to tell him the truth. Ain't buying it. Nomads always stick to their packs. My family's in pieces. That's why I'm headed for Night City. Makes you an outcast among outcasts. Sure as hell hope you'll be on your way before long. He stated. I saw a broadcasting comms tower on my way in. My antenna's down and I need to radio someone. She asked about the broadcast tower she saw somewhere in the town. He replied with malice. What you need's to hightail it out of here without another word. Ain't got no mind to see you drifting around these parts. Got it? When he told her to go, she didn't I've hesitate. Made it clear. She pulled I the door shut and trouble. eased the ben car out of the garage. The bobblehead figure of a vicious dog that she kept on the center control bobbed when she bumped over the garage's threshold. She didn't even think about the risk of disregarding the sheriff's threat. She made her way towards the broadcast tower. Without a doubt, there'd be trouble if the sheriff saw her still hanging around his town, but she'd also be doomed if she couldn't get in touch with her contact. Yes. 
She stopped her car in front of the fenced-in tower, making sure to point the nose of the car towards the road, just in case she needed to exit quickly. She left the car and went to the small gate. It was locked. She made a couple of furtive glances around, then kicked in the gate. After looking around the perimeter, she climbed a few levels to a panel where she connected her transceiver to boost the signal. Although she left the clan life behind, she had no choice but to contact an old friend for help. The device came to life and V let out, Hello? hopelessly in a shaky voice. A masculine voice called out from the other end. It was an old friend. Come in. Come in. Ah, raised you finally. V was momentarily relieved, and her voice even out. She said, Willie McCoy, it's good to hear your voice. V, wish I could say the same. I need your help. One last time. As she requested one last favor, she watched a distant off-road car cut through the desert with a long tail of rising sand behind it. And further away, she could see the gray mass that was Night City. One last time, again? I have to find the client with my payload, but I, I don't know where he is. V explained. Huh. Right place, right time. You were there? My car gave out. The electric coupling, it's a miracle I made it here. Maybe the client left a message. Did you check for me? Last time, though, I mean it. Client's name? Jackie Wells. She gave him the name of the contact. Huh. Actually left a message. He's waiting on a farm. Flicking you the GLO data. She was overjoyed when he sent her the location. Thanks, Willie. I owe you she one. She said. He replied. You do. Just don't get yourself killed. And don't call again. Immediately after the conversation, she flew down the stairs, got in her car, and carefully rolled down the road to her destination. As excited as she was, there was a lingering concern that pushing the car and going too fast would only bring more problems. She didn't know how long her slapdash solution of bypassing the failed coupling module would last. It was an enigmatic situation that required patience. So as much as she wanted to flow it, she took her time.
When she'd finally arrive at her destination, still cautious, she parked the car with the rear face in the trailer. Again, just in case things went south and she needed a quick escape. For a moment, she thought about keeping the engine running, but decided against that when she remembered to fail a coupling module. She turned off the car and went for the front entrance, trying not to wonder too much about the stranger she was about to meet. The place was fitting for the desert. It was a dilapidated little trailer with a boarded up window and a missing front door, accessed via a short set of wooden steps. There was trash sprinkled all around, and illegible graffiti splattered all over the surface of the building like old, regrettable tattoos. Through the gaping entrance, a vending machine welcomed her with bright and surprisingly functioning lights. After climbing the short sagging steps, she found the front door flat on the floor like some extra thick runner rug. He pointed to the right and pushed V's attention to a dark console below a small double window. Inside the console was a purple neon light that threw a dull light over a row of dead abandoned house plants. To the left of the console was a small, busted old-timer television set sitting crooked on a waist-high dresser. And to the right of the console was a dirty platform bed with shelving space underneath. V automatically noticed a roll of eddies on the right middle shelf under the bed. Naturally, she was about to go for it when she heard a voice coming from the other side of the trailer behind her. Oh, I was worried I'd have to turn to farming. <laughs> yeah, I sure hope you're here for me. She was a little surprised, but mostly just caught off guard. When she turned around, she found a man seated on a couch in the dimmest part of the place. His posture was casual and non-threatening, and so was his voice. Well, as non-threatening as one can be while holding a gun. V wasn't alarmed at the sight of the gun though. She carried a concealed one herself. It would be more alarming if he wasn't brandishing iron. After all, this was a badlands and guns were as common as cactuses and more available than toothpaste. Besides, he didn't shoot her yet. He was her contact. Jackie Wells was a sturdy man. Although he was reclining on the sofa, V could tell that he was tall. Symmetrical dark lines with golden accents like traces on a circuit board ran down both sides of his face, highlighting his strong facial features. He had a mark across his long nose that brought attention to his dark green eyes. The sides of his head were cleanly shaved, while the top and back of his head led to a top knot towards the rear. Around his neck dangled a heavy gold chain with a cross matching the gold bracelets and ring on the hand that wasn't holding the gun. He wore a tank top over dark jeans and boots, and over the tank top was a heavy jacket. V immediately thought that the jacket was for more than looks. Otherwise, why wear a jacket in the hot desert of the bad lens? V replied. Are you Wells? And Jackie, por favor. I'm V. Seems you have cargo that needs to be moved. Oh, where I'm from, you share a bit about your soul before you talk biz, eh? It's kind of like a custom. Or just good manners, you know? He said, not wanting to jump straight to business talk. V was surprised. She didn't peg him for that kind of men, but she offered. Why don't we start with you then? He told her. NC native right here. Got Haywood in my blood. She retorted. Never been to NC. That doesn't mean much to me. He explained. So, imagine a place where everyone's like your bro or sis. Or a <laughs> distant cousin at least. <sighs> I think I understand. You don't have to like each other, but it's family. She said. That's Haywood. That and everyone's back in iron. And you? I guess you could say I'm from my own Haywood. After exchanging formalities, he said, You and me, we're gonna get along fine. And with a gentle kick, Cargo. he slid the black package that he kept under one of his boots towards me. Oh. Without delay, she said, Let's load it in the car. A huevo. And she heard him reply in a different language, sounding like Spanish. 
She stepped back and watched him pick up the package after putting his handgun away. He awkwardly carried the seemingly heavy package and followed me to the car. He said, Started thinking you might not come. She replied, I got held up. And you weren't exactly easy to find. I decided to lay low, you know? The sheriff he looked like one grouchy motherfucker. Yep. She opened the trunk and he set the package inside with a grunt. Then he let out. What a fat ass. So, we headed out? On the way, V was obviously excited, and the last thing on her mind was the failed coupling module. She stepped on the gas pedal and pushed the little car as fast as she could towards the border checkpoint. After a moment, she asked, Do you have the manifest from the transport? Of course I do. He said proudly, then asked immediately after. The fixer didn't give you the job deeds? He... he did. I was just making sure. She stumbled through that line. Listen, friend. We're both professionals, ain't we? Jackie made clear. When they were near the water, Jackie asked, Hey, you, uh, sure you've moved contraband before? Why, are you nervous? She replied with her own question, masking her nervousness by imploring a sense of humor. Me? Ha! <laughs> ah, por favor. Well, uh, maybe a little. He replied, partly in Spanish, unable to check his nerves like V. V said nothing. She rolled the car smoothly near the checkpoint. She looked up and slowed down a little more when she heard the chopping blades of an approaching helicopter. The helicopter was either taken off or preparing to land. He glided slowly from one side of the road to the other. V didn't wait to find out. She continued towards the border. At the side of the first group of armed border agents, Jackie announced. Hey, border crossing up ahead. What now? Nothing. They'll scan us and check our papers. V replied. <sighs> okay. I'll do the talking. Again, with a touch of humor in her voice. Dead cars were littered about here and there. Some of them were riddled with bullet holes or were completely burned out. They were a tacit reminder of the Border Patrol's firepower. Perhaps they were left there as signs. Signs that said loudly, fuck around and find out. The closer they got, the more agents they saw. All wearing the same green, heavily padded, armored uniform with bright, conspicuous orange helmets. On their hands were long, automatic guns. The border security checkpoint was a giant concrete structure with three lanes leading to Night City and the same amount coming out to the desert. The latter lanes were empty. Each inbound lane was clearly labeled and color coded. Yellow lane for nothing to declare, blue lane for pre checked, and red for customs declaration. Separating the lanes were concrete highway barriers. The short ones were lying on top with barbed wire, just like the seemingly endless wall that separated Night City from the Badlands. V steered the car into the red lane making sure to abide by the large painted floor signs that read slow in elongated lettering. She stopped in front of the raised automated floor barrier and waited for the car in front of hers to finish. It didn't take long for the car in front to leave, and when the automated barrier flattened to the floor, V eased her car to the inspection area, where an armed agent pointed at her and declared over some speakers. Remain in your vehicle. The security check will begin shortly. I got a real bad Before the agent had finished this. speaking, automated turrets with heavy guns popped up and pointed at the car, while skinners climbed up and down the side walls, sweeping the car with wide yellowish lasers on both sides. Hand me the manifest. They'll need to see it. And he quickly fished out a folded document with large letters spelling out L-O-A. He handed it to V. Grab these. V looked over the document and said, Ah, it's marked LOA. 
Perfect. Jackie said. What's that mean? Lost on arrival. Means the cargo was flagged as to be lost as soon as it crossed the border. Oh. So they know we're smuggling. Well, they're about to find out. The agent said over the loudspeakers. The owner of the vehicle in the inspection area will report for further questioning. <sighs> Chingana madre. What now? If we want the customs officer to turn a blind eye to our dubious docks, we'll need a sweetener. Do you have the credit chip with the bribe? V asked Jackie. Jackie replied uneasily and chuckled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Forgot about that. After getting the credit chip right. from Jackie, she you stepped forgot. out of the vehicle. And Jackie said, I'll keep the engine running. Of a cock up. Do that. V agreed. Then she headed towards the office. She was startled when an SUV came barreling down the blue lane. The vehicle stopped short of hitting her. The driver honked behind dark tinted windows. V continued to the office where a sliding door behind two armed guards parted in front of her. It was a small, bland industrial space. Bullet holes marked the walls, with most concentrated on the far wall facing the entrance. There were people waiting. Most of them were seated on short benches in orange, dedicated areas. A couple of them were standing. On the right, immediately after the entrance, a guard, wearing short sleeves under his body armor, waited behind a counter made from a half wall. The rest of the wall was reinforced with steel and tough glass except for a short rectangular opening where a glass panel can be slid up. The guard said, If you're armed, place your weapon here. V put out her handgun, a heavy revolver. She set it on the counter reluctantly. Not that she had any attachment to the gun itself, but she was skeptical for her own safety. The guard took it, ran the back of his hand over his bra before storing the gun out of sight. Then he said, Now please report to room number two. V made a right down the hall and found the door labeled with a big orange number two. Behind her, the guard repeated, Room two. When the door slid open, V entered to find another guard dressed in a dark t-shirt under a green shoulder holster and two dangling silver duck tags. He sat at the faded orange desk that occupied most of the small dark room. The main light in the room spilled down from a low hanging round ceiling fixture and most of the light was directed towards the middle of the desk. Everything that was peripheral sat mostly in darkness. The room felt unwelcoming and cold and so too was the guard. His face was buried in shadows cast by the orange cap on his head. He barely looked human. His eyes glowed a bright yellow and stood out from his emotionless face. Metal plating outlined the sides of his face and wrapped around like a beard and sideburn combo. His hands, augmented with probably a gorilla arms implant, added to his mechanical and cold appearance. Please sit, he said coldly, gesturing to the chair on V's side of the table. Although there was clearly splattered blood on the chair, V complied with no comment, mostly because she didn't want to show weakness. Papers, said the guard immediately. I know the rules. Everything's there. V handed the paper she had received from Jackie. He replied, It might be, it might not be. As he looked we'll over the see. paper, V glanced around the room to keep herself busy. The guard's handcuffs were on the table next to his cigarette tray. Several other electronic equipment were on the table too, including a cell phone. On the right of the table was a winking light of some sort of big brother on a tripod. He glanced at the back side of the paper mm. with concern and asked, What are you transporting? V replied, It's all in there. The guard set the paper down, leaned back, brought a cigarette to his lips, and lit it with a small lighter. He let out a puff of smoke before asking, Everything? There's one additional enclosure to the manifest, said V, as she leaned over to place the 1,000 Eddie's credit chip on the table. The guard picked up the paper and casually set it over the credit chip. He went on. 
Ah, yes. Remind me, you drive for which nomad clan? She mustered confidence and replied boldly. I don't think that's any concern of yours. He wasn't satisfied with her reply, so he said. Is that what you believe? You know, whenever I see someone like you, I'm oh so grateful not to be on that side of the table. When he was finished talking, he concluded, Go on now. Your associate's waiting for you in the car. V got up and exited the room. Before she got too far, she heard the guard she just met say, Don't forget to take your personal items. She went back to the counter to reclaim her gun. There was another guard hanging out casually by the front desk. The guard set her gun back on the counter. Be careful with that toy, and welcome to Night City. The other guard commented rudely. Those little shits imagine Night City is some kind of paradise. What can you do? Young, naive, which is just a euphemism for ignorant. The one behind the counter replied as V exited the building. She found Jackie waiting on the driver's side. As he took the driver's seat, he asked. What happened in there? She hopped in the passenger seat and told Jackie. I'll tell you soon. You need to get out of here. Yeah, okay. When they had officially crossed the border to Night City, Jackie repeated his last question. You're gonna tell me what happened back there? Let's say I have a bad feeling about this. Said V. Oh. Jackie asked. Happened a lot to you? Rarely. V told him. Smelling trouble around the bend? He asked a follow-up question. At this point, V was tired of the questions. So she said bluntly. Drive, Jackie. Just drive. The shadow of the looming city was sketched onto the darkening night sky. Three large and bright advertising banners protruded up almost endlessly from the black mass to the sky. V was excited to be almost to Night City, but she had a feeling that Night City had an inauspicious, welcoming party prepared for her. Not long after, and before that ominous feeling faded, Jackie said quietly, Someone's coming our way. This does not look good. A caravan of black SUVs abruptly cut off the road in front of them. A stern, disembodied feminine voice over a loudspeaker announced, Stop your vehicle immediately. Let's get out of here. Urged V. On it. Replied Jackie, already pointing the car to the left. The low engine screamed at the sudden increasing speed, and Jackie swerved around a boulder and cactus, went off-road, and sped towards a distant and glowing industrial complex. V took action. She pulled out her gun and leaned out as Jackie steered the car to the industrial complex. She opened fire at the first vehicle behind them and emptied her clip twice. The recalling of her heavy gun, in addition to the moving target, didn't give her much confidence about her aim. As she reloaded, she could hear the clicking of bullets and metal, the sound of shattering glass, and the whistling of near misses as their pursuers retaliated. She emptied another clip. When she noticed fire on the hood of one of the SUVs, she stopped aiming for the shooters and focused instead on the bigger targets, the cars. As soon as she did that, one of the SUVs went up in flames and crashed. She reloaded another magazine and prepared for the next vehicle. When it came, she emptied yet another clip. Jackie maneuvered the car to tight corners, trying to lose the SUVs. One of the pursuing vehicles misjudged a corner and crashed through a line of containers. It went up in flame with a flash of orange light and the booming sound of explosion. To the cacophony, she heard Jackie scream. V emptied her current clip on the hood of the nearest vehicle and watched it explode. She had reloaded and was looking out for the next target when she felt Jackie tugging at her. He called out. She quickly hopped back in the car, and immediately she heard a violent grating sound as the top of the car scraped through a partially lowered garage door. Mierda. 
A moment later, he said. Keep driving. We can't stop here. V told him. Not long after they had lost the pursuers, Jackie steered the car towards an abandoned neighborhood. He sped the car when he found an empty open garage door. V braced herself in anticipation of the collision. A metal shelf stopped the car, leaving the hood badly damaged. V cursed under her breath and Jackie said something in Spanish that sounded like profanity. Broken windshield glass rained down into the car and before V knew, Jackie had already exited the vehicle and had quickly slammed shut the garage door. Then, in English, she rented. I almost tagged our asses! That what you call smuggling? Pacing back and forth in a small space, Supposed to go the tail lights of no the car problems. fell on him like a red theater spotlight. If you think this is my fault, at least have the balls to say so. If he replied, I don't know yet. Is it? He said accusingly. Border security tipped off the corporation that we have their cargo. If he clarified, he whined some more. What's the deal with these borderlies flipping us the finger as they fucking please? With no consequences. He took a risk. He assumed we didn't have a clan backing us, and he was right. <sighs> so what now? When he felt like business time, V asked. We've crossed the border. Now you pay me, and we go our separate ways. Jackie calmed down, leaned on the garage door with his arms crossed and said, I ain't gonna lie. I'm a bit light. I can't pay you now. I have something for you once I collect my scrap for this corporal crap we're carrying. If he felt betrayed in question. Oh, and you just figured I would sit by patiently? Actually, I wasn't gonna pay you at all. He said honestly. gonna bust ass and disappear as soon as we crossed over, but you're all right. With no choice in the matter, V said. I appreciate the honesty. The truth was that she achieved her goal. And she was, technically, in Night City the moment they had crossed the border. The payment was the cherry on top. She only had 300 eddies to get her by in Night City. Yeah, thanks. After a moment, V added. So what's next? Jackie replied as he opened the car's trunk. Now we take a peek inside. Open it. He gestured at the package. V had reservations. I don't know if your client's gonna be happy getting an open package. Usually means trouble. Fuck the client. You gotta start working for yourself sometime. No commission, no middleman. And I need to know what I'm selling if I'm gonna try to find a new buyer. Jackie put her worries to rest. V tapped the display and was surprised to see the brand name and logo of Arasaka displayed on the panel. She let out. Oh shit. Says Arasaka on the crate. We are robbing some heavy hitters. And maybe we'll make some heavy money. Jackie replied and opened the package. The package lid made a hissing sound and a cool air vapor rose up from the cooler. Oh, my miss. A real iguana. He said once he saw the iguana. The uh, lesser Antillian, I think. V sat down and admired the large green lizard sleeping on ice in the package. She felt the cold air as she plunged a hand through the package to poke the unresponsive animal with her index finger. Think you can make some money on it? Sure. Jackie It'll said. Make us happy. Us? V asked. Yeah, partner. We'll go half season. He explained. Any decent fixer will find a loaded gonk interested in a rare gem like this. It's kind of a shame, though. I always wanted a pet. Got the name Manny all thought out. Then asked, Hey, by the way, you uh, got any plans for what you'll be doing in Night City? V replied honestly, I don't have any plans. Spent the last years traveling between states with my nomad family. Jackie asked, I'll probably be waiting for you somewhere, eh? No. We decided to go our separate ways. V said, trying to look away to avoid Jackie's eyes. It must be tough, huh? Said Jackie. I have no one to go back to. But don't you worry. Let me help you find Diggs. You gotta live somewhere. It's important to have people you can turn to. You know, like uh, family. Maybe you'll find your own down in Night City. 
Thanks, much appreciated. Hey, come on. It's nothing. It got chemistry, you and me. Be a crying shame to waste it. Jackie extended a hand. Partner. V was caught off guard when the lizard uh -huh. climbed over her. Jackie said to the lizard, Cuddly little fucker. Okay, the lizard partner. is. Time to grab the said, lizard and scurry out of here. another day ahead of us in this city of dreams Ooh, i love this town love it like you might love a mother who popped you out on the steps of an orphanage once and now stops you to ask if you gotta smoke for her every new day here means a hundred new arrivals but only half these gods will survive a year and that's if it's a good one and why do these peeps come to nc well to be Samurai like Morgan, Black Hand, and Waylon Boa Boa. The greater the risk, the bigger the bounty, kids. Or so they say. But you can only be a Ninja League player for so long. The faster you live, the faster you burn out. 